and now it looks like we are live. So welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. I'm your host, John Henry Sheridan, and today I have a special guest named Diane Spindler. So welcome, Diane. Glad to be here with you. Yeah, me too. I am excited for our discussion. It's a, uh, it's something, it's kind of new territory for me to discuss in the podcast and uh, but I think it's important. I love doing inner work and today we'll be discussing um, the gentle, a gentle approach to trauma. So uh, <clears throat> Diane and I, for the listening audience, Diane and I met through a, a book um, program called the book doulas and we both enjoyed it, I believe, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. and got, got a lot out of it. Uh, there's a, a community feeling that developed there that um, I think it was pretty tangible for the majority of, I don't know, 30 plus uh, participants mm -hmm. and um, you know, real people looking to make a difference in the world, being very vulnerable, I would say, you know, with where they're at. Absolutely. But I, I want to add to that, John, that um, you really made a big difference in being there because you were always there to give somebody a, a boot up and, um, you know, if somebody seemed to be feeling down about something, you'd write something in the chat and it was always really appreciated, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Part of my Buddhist training or my nature is to just kind of be there for the community and it always... Uh, it always benefits my life somehow. You know, the universe supports me more when I show, when I raise my hand and say, Hey, I'll, I'll support the community. And the universe yeah. says, okay, <laughs> well then I'll support you. You know, that's kind of <laughs> the way it works. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Yeah. Yeah. In a good way. Mm -hmm. and, and how was your uh, general experience of that uh, program? Um, I, I was so glad that I joined it. Uh, there was, like you said, the people on there, they were so vulnerable and were willing to share very personal things that had happened to them um, that they're writing books about. I want to write, read all of them. I wish they'd hurry up and get them written. <laughs> um, it's, it sounds like it's, uh, and the two people who were uh, helping us with it, that were in charge of it, did a lovely job too. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, and I mentioned them on the show before, Christine Carlson and Deborah Evans and- yeah. Um, I hope to get them on the show one day. Christine said, said yes. So, you know, I'll eventually get, I'll get there. Um, yeah, I, I definitely appreciated their insight and just their, their holding space, right? They really knew how to hold space for what yes. we we're going through. Yeah. I'm going to actually continue to work with Deb. Oh, awesome. Um, she's agreed to help me with the book. So that's very exciting for me because she had such wonderful insights. Yeah. I can imagine having a, an ally like that can yeah. really keep you on, on point and bring out the best yeah. in you really. And yeah. she did it in such a gentle way. Mm -hmm. So it's a good fit for me. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Gentle reprocessing, which we'll get to for mm -hmm. me too. I'm, uh, I need that gentle touch more or less. I'm a sensitive guy. I, sometimes I wish I wasn't, but you know, fortunately I found a, um, editor and, uh, she's helping me work with my uh music mind my music for health book which i've retitled mind your music oh i like um, that yeah thanks i yeah. feel good about it finally it just sat right yeah i'm like that's kind of what i'm talking about you know and um anyway working with her is a pleasure she's going to be on the show next friday so oh nice friday. Yeah. nice name is andy um all right cool so without further ado let's uh let's talk about you diane so um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you'd like to share? Where did you grow up? Uh, where are you now? Um, well, I've always been kind of an outlier, um, kind of ahead of the curve and misunderstood. If, if I wanted to look at it that way, I just like to look at it as people haven't caught up with me yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I'm kind of been a loner in general. I, I do have a family. I've got uh, three kids and six grandkids. And so that that's brought a lot of uh, love and happiness to my life to have them. And 
they're all just really nice people. You know, that's what I'm proud of is that they turned out to be kind, caring people. Wow. Yeah. And they're raising their kids that way. So that's really kind, really nice. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's very, very powerful contribution that you've made to humanity right there, right? Just in having children who, who've been raised to be and have become good people. And I've always liked to teach. Um, when I was a kid, I taught downhill skiing. Um, mm -hmm. And then I taught yoga. I've taught, I still teach yoga sometimes and uh, meditation. So, and then I teach general reprocessing. So I, I just really enjoy teaching. I, I love it when people have that aha moment and go, wow, it, I did that pose or I got to that place in meditation or understood what you're talking about around general reprocessing. Hmm. So that, that, that gives me a thrill that yeah. aha moment in somebody else's eyes. Oh yeah. Yeah. As a teacher, I I've been there and, uh, it's, it can be rare, right? There can be a lot of dry, dry spells where that doesn't really happen, but, but when it does, and then you could get it happening a lot, maybe because you're in the flow and then you're just more effective at that era too. But, uh, at that point in time, um, yeah, I just want to say a shout out to Darlene Carney, who's watching on Facebook and she's gave us an image of a heart with listen with the headphones on. So she's oh, listening. Nice. So hello, Darlene. And to anyone else who's watching live, hello, feel free to put comments and uh, questions for Diane uh, or myself in the comment section. And um, as we continue to have a discussion and uh, where did you grow up and where do you live now? If you'd care to share, did you say that already? I'm not sure. Uh, no, I actually um, am living on the same piece of land I came home to when I was a baby. <laughs> um, being a cancer, it, you know, my, my horoscope sign is cancer and they like their homes. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, the house that I came home to was torn down, but it was, the lot was open for almost 40 years. Wow. And then I got a chance to, to build on it. Wow. So it's the, same, it's the same piece of land. It's just, and I went to school about 20 minutes, uh, college, both for undergrad and graduate school, about 20 minutes from where I live now. Hmm. So I haven't really moved away. I love to travel, but I like to come home. Yep. Yeah, that, that's great. And that you're so close to home. Or, I mean, you are, it's in a different building, but yeah, just some, some beautiful about it, some poetic. I mean, that is the hero's journey after all, right. To uh, come to make that, that circle back to where you started and to tell the story. And that's basically what you're doing. You're telling the story of your life with your book, you know, <clears throat> and uh, your message, I suppose. Um, and this is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Massachusetts, you said? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I know where I live. So I figure <laughs> everybody does. <laughs> you don't have to, we need your address, but uh, just yeah. like. No, no, no. I, I live actually in central, the center of Massachusetts, the dead center. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, I live in uh, Brooklyn, in Marine Park, Brooklyn, and I actually, uh, I live a stone's throw away from the house I grew up in. Oh, wow. So it's not so the similar. property. Yeah, but definitely similar. Um, I did live most of my life in Brooklyn. When I moved out for a while, it was 10 minute walk away, 15 minute walk away. I went, I attended, yeah, I attended Bro Brooklyn College. So I, it was a commuter school. Similar, similar idea. Uh, with the walk, it probably took me 45 minutes, but you know, by bike, it was 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I was taking the bus, I mean, but um, yeah, so I could definitely relate. And I love traveling myself. Uh, there's nothing quite like coming home. So I definitely hear that. Uh, so I understand that you've been, uh, you have 30, over 30 years of experience in clinics, agencies, and private practice. Can you give us some more details as to what that journey has been like for you? And, and of course, what you do in that regard? Well, um, I got my undergraduate degree right after high school. And then um, I had a family. And when my, my kids were 
in middle school, I went back to school and got my graduate degree so I could become a therapist. Um, so it was actually really good for them to see me studying so hard. I never had to say to my, my kids, did you do your homework? Because they watched how hard I studied and they, it, it was a good modeling for them, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so once, and they, by the time I got out of school, they were old enough to be home by themselves a little bit. So I went back to work and I had some amazing clinics that I worked in learning all kinds of things. And I was like a sponge, just picking up anything I could. Uh, mm. And eventually some of that material ended up being put into general reprocessing. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so I'm imagining, I don't tell, you know, let me know how true this is. Uh, of those 30 years, the first 10 or something must have been working for some uh, business or, or clinic. I'm not sure how that yeah, those yeah. things operate as, as like kind of like one small piece of it. And then as you developed, then you, you got to private practice, which is where you kind of run the show yourself. How long were you involved with something before private practice became a reality? Um, so it was probably eight years I was in clinics. I love working in clinics. Uh, I love the population. I felt I could be really useful. Um, it, it was, it was really challenging. They weren't, they weren't easy, um, people to work with. I mean, the people were fine. The clinics, the weren't as easy to work with. I, I, I as I said uh, earlier, I'm kind of an outlier. I'm not really good with rules and they had a lot of rules. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. It was, it was a little problematic, but um, I love working with the people. And I finally stopped working at my last clinic. So I was working at a clinic one day a week and then private practice for, for quite a while. And I finally stopped working at the clinic because they wanted me to get shots I didn't want to get. So, you know, kind of yeah. going and, back to where we are now. Right. And, and what, yeah, what year was that, that they were asking for certain shots out of curiosity? I mean, if you don't want to date yourself, but I'm curious how, um, when that type it was of thing in, was It was on. in the late nineties. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted me to get a, I think a hepatitis B shot, but I was only there one day a week. And um, I tend to be sensitive to the world and I've mm -hmm. never gotten any vaccines at all. So, mm -hmm. except when wow. I was a kid. That's great. Um, they just, mm. me and medicine just don't get along very well. I hear you. I hear you. So anyway, that's, that's a whole separate issue. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> they realized that I probably couldn't get the vaccine because I was allergic to half the things in it. <laughs> so they said, I don't have to get it, but it, it just started to kind of go downhill after that. Hmm. Yeah, I think life gives us these uh, curveballs, surprises along the road that kind of just make a decision that we might have been feeling that we want to work towards or a path we want to go towards. And life will just say, okay, here you go. Here's your, we're going to assist you and make this easier. The timing was perfect. Mm -hmm. It really was. And um, it, at that point, I had quite a, I had a fairly good size practice. So, I mean, they don't actually pay you much at the clinics. So mm -hmm. I had to look at it as volunteer work in order to be there. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. So it was a whole lot better doing private practice as far as that was concerned. I see. Hmm. But again, the clinic experience was crucial probably in like cutting your teeth or whatever phrase oh, you want Oh, absolutely. To use. And like I said, I, I really loved the population I got to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a lot of different people that I don't get in private practice. Sure. Yeah, um, I can see that. Mm -hmm. Knowing how my experience of teaching with organizations versus trying to do my own private lessons, which I've done mm -hmm. for years, it's, it's a very different experience. But of course, when I, if I am focused on running my own guitar lesson thing, you can make a lot more money depending on how much you're willing to work. Right. Um, and Darlene uh, chimed in, says, you are, you're where you're supposed to be. Yeah. I think she's absolutely right. Yeah. 
I've been mm -hmm. working on this book, John, for over 10 years, and I keep working on it and working on it, and it just doesn't happen. And this was the year. It's, it's going to happen this year. And it feels just right. Mm -hmm. That's you know, cool. and all the pieces are coming together. Wow. Yeah, another synchronicity we have uh, these like parallel timelines. Uh, I started writing my autobiography um, in 2010, like with some seriousness. And I got 30 pages in or something. And I was 30 years old uh, almost. And uh, the story just wasn't, it just wasn't time, you know? Yeah. I, I, I couldn't have, if someone told me, you know, you got to wait 10 years and yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I would have been pretty upset about that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But the universe just guided me from one thing to the next. And there's a lot of great stuff in between, you know, albums and other creative. I did put out guitar books, but but this autobiography just wants to come out. You know, that, and that's one of the things I'm... Well, now you have more years on. to talk about, too. Yeah, exactly. It feels really good. 40 is like a little bit... It just feels like a good solid number mm -hmm. to cover. 30 would have felt a little bit. And there was just so much growth that happened in my 30s. Uh, really, that's when my, my marriage began. So there's you just got that lovely little son of yours. Right. So yeah, he didn't happen before that, yeah. you know, so yeah. So I think the timing is, is really great. And also the, the lockdown thing really gave me the opportunity to focus on it and be, get mm -hmm. clear that this is what I want to do. So yeah, no complaints, but sometimes we do want things to happen a lot sooner than the universe is prepared to support us in it in, in a way you know I well I, I have actually been teaching other clinicians how to do general reprocessing and for people that don't know what i'm talking about it, it's a method i can come up with to work with trauma for people that helps them release it relatively fast compared to most of the things that are out there but i started teaching in uh, 2001 so I've been teaching it for 20 years. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely want to get into uh, that. And um, let's see. So so the eight years in the clinics, and then it went to kind of private practice. And then you say agencies. Was that part of the clinic era, or is that that's something f um, further along the line? The agencies, like, yeah, the agencies, clinics, they, they're sort of the same um okay got it yeah um so amy levin our friend from uh, book Duelist, says hi diane great to be here with you and john hey amy nice to see you yeah awesome thank you for joining yes absolutely appreciate so, the support yes yeah indeed same here so can you explain how you're discovering cognitive therapy impacted your practice of therapy. And also you mentioned in a previous conversation, Jung and uh, uh, the other Freud. popular psychologist, Freud, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah that however guy. that plays into it, you know, what were your like aha moments along the way that helped you see that uh, this path was actually, had the potential you were hoping it had? Well, when I was in my undergraduate degree, there was no mention of trauma at all. In fact, it hadn't even been discovered yet, um, even though kids were coming back from Vietnam, very traumatized, but um, it was kind of like, well, get over yourselves kind of attitude at that point, or what's your problem? You know, you're not over there anymore. They, they really didn't have much of an understanding of, of how um, the brain takes in trauma and keeps it. And that's something I'll read about a little bit later. But um, so in in undergrad, I got my degree in psychology and sociology, which uh, a lot of there was a lot of discussion of um, Freud because uh, I went to Clark University and it was the first, the only place that Freud actually spoke in the United States. Oh, really? So um, I was very enthusiastic about that idea. I even learned German so I could read it in, in, um, in German. I right. never got quite that good, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I worked at it anyway. Um, and one of he, what one of the things he he was the first person to say, okay, um, people are more than just a physical body. 
they have a mind and their and what happens to their physical body what happens in their lives affects their minds so one of the things he was getting from his his patients and he was a regular doctor doctor md doctor was that they would talk to, he would talk to them and um he saw a lot of young girls that had very odd symptoms and it turns out what the young girls told him is that their fathers were sexually abusing them and they didn't know what to do with that and they couldn't talk to anybody about it and nobody was interested mm -hmm. um and when he came out with papers about that you can imagine how happy everybody was <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so they wanted to basically disbar him. So he kind of backtracked and said, oh, no, no, that's not what I meant. That's just symbolic of what was going on or something to that effect. Um, and But his early work was really a huge breakthrough. And then his student, who was young, um, started looking at the uh, subconscious mind and how the subconscious mind actually holds the traumas. Um, and that's why these young women were having such odd symptoms because it was stuck in their, their subconscious mind, but they didn't know what to do about it. So that was kind of a seed planted. And then, as I said, I went on and got my, um, had my family. Mm -hmm. And when they were in mid middle school, I went back to school for two years to get my degree as a, um, uh, counselor and psychology. And one of the things, one of the classes I took was in uh, cognitive therapy. So the idea of cognitive therapy is you can actually change the way you feel about something by changing your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so I know Saturday Night Live had this skit on where the guy talks to himself in the mirror and says, I'm good enough, I'm better than good enough, I'm great, and, and mm -hmm. you know everybody thought that was pretty funny, but that's basically cognitive therapy. The trouble with co I found with cognitive therapy was it was putting the cart before the horse, so to speak, mm -hmm. because as long as that trauma was stuck and you just put the positive words on top of it, when you got triggered by the trauma, the trauma would still come right through all those positive words and the negative beliefs would come out. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that point, um, I thought, oh, doc, it, it, it's missing something. The cognitive uh, presentation was helpful, but you need to clear the trauma first before you can actually do the um, cognitive uh, positive beliefs. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's how the cognitive therapy kind of came into it. And then uh, I was at a clinic and um, I heard about EMDR, which people know, know about EMDR quite a bit now. Um, and uh, they for, started, for those of us who don't know what it is, uh, can you say what it stands for? Um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Okay. Much better to calling it EMDR. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Francine Shapiro in 89 came up with this idea that if you used eye movement back and forth, so she just put her hands be back and forth and people would watch her fingers. Um, and that actually, they found out now, uh, has a way of getting inside your brain because where your eyes go is where your mind is, where you're paying attention. So sometimes if you're, trying to think of a word you might look up in the corner and all of a sudden the word comes to you and then you go back to talking to the person you're talking to mm -hmm. um, because you're actually kind of looking in your brain for that word and your eyes know, know where to look for it hmm. it's very cool <laughs> but anyway she didn't know about that at that time so she's just noticing that when she would look back and forth and she had a problem um, the problem would start to take care of itself and then she started working with um, people who had traumas and doing the same thing. And their brains would be able to process the trauma through. So 
that was that was really interesting to me because I I could see where this might be a way of actually getting people feeling better quicker. Um, but as with cognitive therapy, EMDR also had some issues. And in talking to Francine about it, she was not well, she wasn't interested in looking at the issues. She just she wanted to. Do a, she just said people should be more careful when they were doing it. But I, I thought it had a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. So I also learned trauma theory, ther uh, tra trauma theory um, from that. And mm -hmm. basically trauma comes in four components. So it's the event that happened. So say if you were a kid and you didn't get enough brown, you didn't get brownies, everybody in the neighborhood had brownies at your house, but your mother wouldn't let you eat the brownies. So that becomes a trauma for you. Mm -hmm. And then the two next ones, I call them the twins because they always come together. So that's an emotion that comes up for you and also where you feel it in your body. So if you were hurt by not getting enough brownies, you might feel that in your stomach. And if you're angry, you might feel it in your fists. And if you were sad, you might feel it in your eyes. So those two come together. And then the the fourth one is probably the most damaging. It's the negative beliefs you start to believe about yourself. So now we see where cognitive therapy comes in. Um, that those negative beliefs are, so you might think, you know, I, I'm unlovable. My mother doesn't even give me brownies like she gives everybody else, or I'm too fat, or I'm ugly, or there's something wrong with me, I'm broken. So those types of negative cognitions start to take form when you have a trauma. So the trauma is made up of all of those things. And when the brain, which I'm gonna discuss later, can't handle it, it just puts it in the back of your head and it's just sitting there all the time, just waiting to be triggered. So that was basically the trauma therapy I learned through EMDR, which was tremendously helpful in um, coming up with something, some way of treating trauma. I mean, I didn't even know it existed. And there are a lot of people out there, even clinicians today, they're not, it's not being taught in schools particularly. I mean, they may mention it, but it's not really being taught so no. that people understand how it works. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I think uh, trauma, I mean, I, I haven't studied uh, psychotherapy to any great degree, but um, I'm pretty well read mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends. And I think generally speaking, the, the word trauma, the way it appears in uh, my life mm -hmm. up till now is um, quite vague. And has a, I don't know about a negative connotation, but a heavy connotation. Very heavy. You know? And probably um, pretty, yeah, very heavy. And probably, um, it's probably unclear, you know, until we've had some discussions and I've been speaking to one other friend about it recently. I didn't, I didn't really know what it was. And <clears throat> to describe it, like the, in the, 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 through the theory concept and everything, that definitely helps to see that it could be something as simple as uh, not getting brownies, which when it happens, it doesn't seem all that simple, but you know, it, that, that's different from a car accident, right? But, but for Absolutely. people to understand it's the, the same mechanism at play. Well, and when something like that happens, it could happen to you and you're fine with it. It could happen to me and it's devastating. You know, it depends on our histories of with brownies. Maybe I don't like, you know, maybe you don't like brownies, so it's not a big deal for you. Or maybe I have a sweet tooth and it's really a big deal for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm embarrassed because I have to watch other people walk, you know, eat the brownies and, and you know, you'd rather go out and play. It's, it depends on each person. Trauma is right. very individualistic. Mm -hmm. um, but it does make a difference on how secure you feel in general in your life. You know, how you were brought up, um, how loving your parents were, were they there for you? You know, that sort of thing makes a big difference in how trauma hits you. Yeah. Would it be safe to say that uh, nobody is free of trauma? Everyone has trauma issues to work with. Would the degrees, of course, will be will vary, but... 
or the intensity? Um, I would agree with that. Uh, absolutely. Um, I have one of the clinics I was at the, my boss, who was my director, didn't really know much about trauma. And one of the other clinicians where we were in a, a staff meeting mentioned she thought like 80% of the people coming into the clinic had trauma. And he was about to say, no, um, that he said, no, that's not true. And I said, you're right. It's not true. It's 100%. Mm -hmm. And he right. was going to say, oh, no, it can't be that high. Hmm. And the people coming into the clinic had had really tough lives. So easily 100% of them right. had some kind of trauma. So hmm. when I do an intake, what I'm looking for is those traumas. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, yeah, the greater or less if for one, it's one person, it's the brownies, the next person, it's the brownies plus something horrible, you know, that the other person may not have had, but right. I, I, there's all sorts of different degrees of it. Yeah. And Darlene uh, shared that um, trauma is a big issue today. Uh, I would agree. I, I'm hearing the word a lot more just in the public. Consciousness. Well, I, I think that that's one reason this book needs to come out because the first half of the book, I call it a, a gentle tutorial on trauma. It's just explaining what it is. So mm -hmm. the people could go, Oh, that's why I feel this way. Yeah. Because oh, just, yeah. just identifying it. And so many, um, as I mentioned, clinicians don't know about it. And of course, doctors don't know about it. And I think it's important that you, that people recognize that this has a real huge effect on people. Yeah. And it can make, as Freud found out, it can make them really sick. You know, they can have really weird symptoms that don't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Wow. And actually, quick question about Freud, uh, just jumping back. So was Freud a psychologist? Is that the no, psychology? No, it wasn't such a thing. That, that's what I was thinking. So what was he? He was an MD doctor. Oh, uh, okay. I see. You know, he, he, but he was somebody that was interested in listening to the stories that people told. Mm -hmm. And he was starting to kind of put together that idea that some, the way people are treated has an effect on their physical beings. That was a, it, it was a huge change because before that, nobody had any clue that that was a thing. Wow. So he was kind of willing to just dig a little deeper and maybe really want to help people. Yeah, I think so. And, and he saw it differently than everybody else. You know, there's that one person that, that looks at something and sees it totally different. And, he, and then he started, he was curious. Mm -hmm. He wanted to understand why is this happening? Cool. So, so in a way he's like the, the first psychologist or psychiatrist. Well, he's, he's referred to as the father of psychology. Mm, yeah. I, I mean, I certainly am vaguely aware of that something started with him. I didn't know it really kind of started with him. I, I didn't, you know, n never studied him, but uh, yeah. Wow. All right. So um, what led you to feel inspired to create your own therapeutic approach, gentle reprocessing? You've covered some of that, but if there's anything else before you describe the process, which I'd like you to do. Uh, so describe um, the approach. I, I got out of, uh, I got out of grad school and um, I didn't feel that I had been trained to do anything. They just said, here's your client. You know, I'm like at the working at a clinic and um, good luck. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I did, I did uh, an internship, which was really helpful to, and, and, and the, the internship basically looked at family therapy and how important family therapy was. And so that was a whole part of um, that got thrown into general reprocessing as well. But that was wonderful. I mean, it was a great internship, the great people I was working with, but nobody had really shown me how to do therapy. So I was just kind of like winging it <laughs> and had no clue. <laughs> but I was noticing that, and back then in the, in the um, early 90s, the relationship that a therapist had with their client was the strongest tool they had. So if you could have a good relationship with your client, you could help them to, sh to shift. 
um, how they thought about the world and the directions they were going in and how they felt about themselves. Those um, negative beliefs that they had gathered up until that time really set in strong and concrete and trying to get those to, to change and show them that they're, they can do some, something different and they can um, succeed in life was, that was kind of, I saw as my purpose, but how to do it was a whole new, different thing. Mm -hmm. So I did the whole thing with having good relationships with my clients for um, quite a while. I mean, I had one young girl I worked with for a number of years because I, I had her in also as a client when I was an intern. And um, we used to do outreach work with her, with our clients. So I would take her places and we would, you know, do things. So to show her how to, how to do things that she hadn't learned from, from her parents or from school. And she was 14. I'm walking down the street with her and um, these very cute boys were coming in the other direction. And she looks at me and she says, would you mind if I just walked behind you and pretended you, I wasn't with you? <laughs> and I thought that was quite a compliment. She was treat treating me like I was her mom. <laughs> Okay. I said, cool. not in your life. You walk right beside me. <laughs> but I think it was good for her to hear that too, that, you know, I was going to stand my ground and, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to play those games, but um, it, it told me that I was doing something right, but still it wasn't, it wasn't fast enough for me. I wanted people to get fast, get better fast. And um I was finding that some of my, my kids that I was working with had a lot of sexual abuse and there was no, no way of helping them feel better about that. So I kept looking, you know, when I was in graduate school, it was finding the, the um, cognitive therapy that was important. And then when I was doing my internship, it was doing family work. But even with family work, I found we did some great family work and then we'd see the families like three months later and they'd be right back to where they were. <laughs> so it wasn't, yeah. you know, everybody was getting very stuck in wherever they were. And I was curious as to why that was. So I just kept looking and EMDR was part of that, finding that um, as, as I've already described to you, the whole trauma therapy and realizing that EMDR actually rewired the brain. And we didn't actually figure that out until recently because they can do brain scans mm -hmm. and they can see how it changes things. But we could see it through how people felt better. Yeah. So before EMDR, did you kind of not really factor in trauma consciously into your therapy? Um, well, I got my degree in 90 and mm -hmm. in 93 i had emdr okay. so it was really close mm -hmm. but That's i was trying in a lot of that during that time I was doing family therapy mm -hmm. so i have a license in both family therapy and individual therapy mm -hmm. yeah i could see so basically you you would seeing there was a need in society in your in your world where you worldview and uh you felt that you would like to make a bigger impact but you didn't see that the tools you had at hand were going to do the job so then you go ahead and say let's take this to the next level and just kind of like dug in well it, it was more like i kept looking for somebody else to do that yeah right you know that's what I it kept, sounds like yeah yeah i kept waiting for somebody else to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And this is going to be the, uh, I called it my holy grail. This is going to be the, the, what I'm seeking is this method to help people get better quickly. And um, I didn't find it. And the closest I came was the EMDR and pairing that with the cognitive and what Freud had to say and about the past being important and what the family work had to say about um, how families impact all of that. I put it together, I, I basically cherry picked 
all of them and said, okay, these are the things I see that work with these th these methods. And those are the things I don't, I see that don't work. So like with cognitive therapy, it didn't work to just say the positive cognitions because it, as I said earlier, the negative would come to the surface. Um, I heard once one person describe it perfectly. They said, it's like, if you had a, have a bowl of um, worms and you spray whipped cream over the top. So, and you say here, this is dessert. It's all mm -hmm. fixed, it's lovely. And, but when stress comes, the worms come to the surface. Doesn't look like dessert anymore. <laughs> so you really need to clear the worms out, which is the 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 way I look at it. The worms are the the um, negative emotions and negative body sensations. Mm -hmm. When you clear the worms out, then you can start making a dessert. Yeah, that's the time you put the whipped cream on, which is the positive cognitions. Yeah, it, uh, the picture I get, um, which it's not a clear analogy, but I just can't help thinking about it whenever we've been when we've been talking about it now and previously is uh, gardening, you know, I've done a lot of gardening in my day and usually with my mom and I'm my own as well. And uh, I had experience a couple of years ago of uh, digging out some rose bushes, rose mm -hmm. bushes that have been there for oh, a yeah. long time and a rhododendron that was like really oh, i had to use an axe gnarly and uh, yeah. you know and getting those things out like i was like it was like this savage uh return to primal existence to get it out almost like ripping out the the heart of a of a monster you know and that, i'm mean, not that the rose bush was evil in any way but but just to get it out was a lot of work and then well the get, roots were really deep yeah and and that's what it, that's what trauma seems like to me is that unless you get that root and you do the work, it doesn't have to be this, you know, you can be gentle, but unless you do that work, which is essential. Remind me not to have you work on me with a trauma, okay? <laughs> <laughs> right, no axes involved, no axes. No, okay, system. good, good. <laughs> yeah, but that just that, because it was very therapeutic. When I did that, there were some things I really felt I was letting go, getting those rose bushes out of my mother's garden, that things that they were just lingering, I'm like, it was challenging my, my beliefs and of course there's some attachment to it because i've seen it there for so many years and uh but and it felt like almost guilty like should i really be taking an axe to this thing but it wasn't beautiful anymore and it mm -hmm. was taking up space where other new healthy things can grow so, it almost became a weed yeah right definitely it, like this really uh obnoxious weed that was you know taking up precious space in the garden mm -hmm. So it just that jumps out at me. Well, it, it's it's it, it's one of the analogies I, I use in the in the book is that and, and when I'm talking to my clients too, most most of the stuff in the book I've talked to clients about and um, it helps them understand trauma so they don't feel I don't want them to feel crazy. I, I you know they're not crazy, they they just have if they broke their leg people could see the cast and see oh yes i see you broke your leg but when you break your spirit it's not so evident mm -hmm. and it, the, the understanding is not there right. so i had this 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 kid that um he was in his 20s he got through college but then he moved back with his mom and he basically was not able to leave the house and except to do this very um part-time job that he had just to pay for a few things around the house. And um, he was so anxious and he came to me, we worked on everything I could find. And he still had all this anxiety. His depression was a little better. He's sleeping a little better, but he still was not doing well. So we ended up going back to when he was in the womb and cleared what it was like being in the womb of a very anxious mom. And he was a very sensitive guy. And so he brought that anxiety with him thinking it was his into the world. Hmm. And when we cleared it, so this is the magic part of, of the work that I do. So he comes in next week and he says to me, this is the last time I'm gonna see you for a while. I said, oh, okay, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm, I've got a, a ticket to, uh, South Africa to see my friend 
and I'm going to spend some time with him and then I'll come back and we can do some more work. I mean, this is a guy that wouldn't even get out of his mother's basement, <laughs> say nothing of go forward. And he says, I said, how's the anxiety? He said, it's gone. It literally was gone wow. because that was where it was from. And going back to your garden analogy, what I find is that the further back I can go to pull out the weeds, because, you know, if you plant a garden, probably weeds come up with it. Usually, you know, you've got vegetables in there, but there's some weeds. If you get the weeds at the beginning, it gives plenty of space for the vegetables to grow and nutrients. Mm -hmm. But if you wait, the weeds take over and those poor vegetables don't have a chance. And mm -hmm. that was kind of how I felt about this guy, that he had this weed that was anxiety from the womb and it had taken over his whole life. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it's he, profound. he came home, he moved to like California, he got his degree in counseling. And I hear from him every, every once in a while, you know, just to let me know how he's doing. Wow. And they, he got his degree in counseling too. So that means he could pass it on, you know, Yeah. this yes, ability did. to help people, which he was helped, you know. But it, it, it's, so you, going back to your question of why, how, um, it, I, I'm not like brilliant and I'm not like um, the hardest of workers or anything like that, <laughs> but I saw a need and thought, well, I'll just do a little bit of this. I'll just do a tiny bit and, you know, keep adding to it. And that's basically what's happened over the 20 years is just a little bit here, a little bit here, and a little bit there. Um, and But the, the building of it has taken my whole career. I mean, even back to my undergraduate years, because mm -hmm. I just tend to see the world that way where I try to put the pieces together so it works the best. You know, if I'm cooking, that's what happens. Um, I, I don't usually use a cookbook very well. Yeah, what what's really stands out to me about your method and your history, because I wouldn't have known unless I spoke, spoke to you or liked about it, is that it's very pure, comes from a pure place, you know, because you wasn't like, I want to make a name for myself and create my own psychiatry thing. It was like, I just want to freaking help people as best I can. And so far, the tools that I believe should exist don't exist in, in my, you know, to the level of my satisfaction or speed that I'm hoping for. So I guess I got to do some work here. And, and then you did it. So it was, it was from that very pure, what's it, uh, necessity as a mother invention, that type of thing. Right, right. I mean, I tried to give this to Francine Shapiro, the person who invented EMDR. I said, look, this is, this is what I found that will fix the process. You don't have to even give me credit, you know, <laughs> to start teaching it di differently. And she right. said, oh no, you know, we're doing, we're fine. <laughs> right. That's cool. And you know, that's a blessing in disguise, you know, cause this way it, you can really own it, you know? Right. But I was perfectly happy to give it away to somebody to take, take off with it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, she'd already built a lot of, um, a group that was supporting her and had teachers out there and it, it could have taken off so much quicker. And that was why I thought it would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. But um, they became very uh, possessive of their process and didn't want anybody else um, messing with it. Yeah, no, I, I know that the world of ideas and the world of that we live in Still, and especially the one we're coming out of, I think we are entering a new realm, more a little bit more sharing, open realm of being. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm a musician, so I know all about copyright laws and and of hesitation to work, you know, to have my own ideas influenced by people because I don't want them to lay claim to what I thought, you know. And then when there's no clear owner, who's going to move it forward? Things like that happen. But so I, I can understand maybe where someone like that's coming from, but. I also understand your pure desire to just want to make things well, I, better. 
a lot of my students, which are clinicians, um, they have been you know, doing their own thing. And then they take this and they combine it with what they're already doing. So it becomes a different animal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I say, I always say to them, do that, you know, take this and use it the way you feel comfortable because then it's really becomes theirs and it becomes, you know, it's, it's also stays pure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So um, I'm looking forward to our next thing, which is uh, as you and I, met through a, a book writing course. Um, I've had the good fortune to hear some of your writing. Um, so I'd uh, love for you to read an excerpt from, from your book for our listening audience. Uh, I will actually run to the bathroom as you begin reading and okay. on the replay, I will hear it. Okay. But I'll get back because I have a small bladder, uh, sorry. Um, but yeah, feel free to just at your leisure, just introduce okay. it and then begin reading and I'll be back. And, uh, I apologize to your audience because um, this this is uh, not the final draft, but I did think it might be useful in just helping people understand trauma a little bit. Yes, excellent. And, and Amy, by the way, did uh, chime in saying that, yes, I see how pulling out the old is digging deep to get to the wounds like you did getting to the roots of the plants. So, yeah. Yeah, we're in parallel grounds, you and I. <laughs> yeah. All right. So All right. Please, uh, Go do what you need to yeah. do, and I'll entertain. Thanks. <laughs> so this chapter is on how the brain works with trauma, from my perspective, because um, I'm not a researcher. I'm more of a very curious psychotherapist. Fortunately, with all the brain scans that are available today, there are some strong theories out there about how trauma changes the way the brain works. Though no one, is, no one knows for sure, it appears that trauma changes the wiring in the brain. According to Earl Gray, PhD, normally when we take in information through our five senses, it reports to the center of our brain or our hippocampus for processing. Then it is sent to the thalamus to decide where it needs to be stored. At that point, our brain says, ah, this looks familiar. I know where to send this. And the information is sent to the front of our brain, which is where our prefrontal cortex is, which I call the brain's filings cabinet. It also does other things, but that's one of its, its purposes. The, the prefrontal cortex acknowledges a past, present, and future timeline. Events can be filed in a chronologi chronological order. But when something overwhelmingly upsetting happens to us, such as in the case of trauma, the hippocampus becomes unable to handle it. The unprocessed in information about the situation is sent to the thalamus, but this time it is rejected and sent to the primitive brain or the reptilian brain, which is in the back of our heads. Or a more simple way to put it, if our brain can't handle it, it is placed on the back burner. Here, there is no acknowledgement of a past or future. Everything is happening in the present. The event, the emotions, the body sensations, and the negative beliefs feel as if they are happening now. So we react with a flight, fight, or freeze reaction to the upsetting situation. We want to run away, we want to stand and fight, or we can't move at all. The situation does not get process processed properly and we are stuck reliving it over and over. The upsetting event, the emotions, and the body sensations connecting to that event and the negative cognitions that come out of this event all replay involuntarily in the primitive part of our brain. This can look like flashbacks, nightmares, or other trauma symptoms that keep us reliving the traumatic past. So let's look at an example of what this would look like in real life. What causes your brain to assign a trauma to one event and not to another may become clearer. 
one summer day, you go to the beach with some friends. You have a good but uneventful day and really don't think about that day again. In fact, 10 years later, you might not even be able to remember what beach you went to exactly, who you went with, or even if it was a good beach day. But what if you had gone to the beach with friends and you had, had almost drowned? Your memory might have a different outcome. Let's say the lifeguard had pulled you out of the water after a rogue wave had pulled you away from your friends and sucked you under. You were told when the lifeguard brought you up on the beach, you were not breathing. He resuscitated you, you coughed up seawater, you came back to life, staring at all the people around you. That day at the beach, you remember vividly. You remember whom you went with and which beach it was. You remember what you had for lunch and the temp what the temperature was. You remember how your body felt as you thought you were going to die and how it felt when you came to. In addition to remembering the day clearly, when something reminds you of that memory, a trigger, all the emotions you felt that day come pouring back. You might be reminded if you choke on a glass of water and the sudden terror of not being able to catch your breath might bring you back to the scene when you were underwater and couldn't breathe. Then all the other emotions and body sensations as well as the whole event come flooding back. And the belief that you're not safe at that moment is there too. All the components of a trauma appear and you're back to that memorable day when you almost died. Now you can see why one event was so, un so forgettable and you can't forget the other one. Both were very similar to each other, yet your reaction to the second description was very different. As was mentioned earlier, the traumatic event was sent to the reptilian brain at the base of your head. The reptilian brain only lives in the present with no past or future. When this event gets triggered, that whole terrible event comes rushing back in the form of a flashback and you relive, relive it as if it is happening now. The memory waits on the back burner uh, for the brain to learn how to process it. Over time, such a backlog of these unresolved traumas that one day all this trauma becomes so overwhelming, the psychological diagnoses and symptoms start to appear. Let me explain what is happening with all these unresolved traumas on the back burner. They're not sitting back there doing nothing. At one time in history, we would have had time to mull over these incidents and bring some kind of closure to them. Life was slower and simpler. Now it is easy to become overwhelmed by our lives and not have time to think things through. The backlog in our primitive brains get to be very stressed out. Let's look at this backlog in the form of an analogy. When you go to a megaplex movie theater, you can walk in and see a variety of kinds of movies. Each brings out different emotions in the audience. A love story might make you feel happy or nostalgic. A thriller could make you feel tense and scared. A science fiction or fantasy movie might bring you into a new world you had never imagined. It might make you feel hopeful or hopeless, depending on how the story goes. As soon as somebody enters the theater, they start to feel the appropriate feelings. But whether anyone attends the show or not, it costs the theater an energy to run the movie and keep the room comfortable. When a traumatic event happens to a child, that child stores the memory of the event, the emotions and body sensations that are felt during the event and most damaging of all, the negative beliefs the child has about himself because of the event. What does this look like in real life? Okay, a child is beaten by his father. He might feel afraid in his lungs, angry in his fists and sad in his heart. He might believe he is a bad person. He deserved it and he will never ever amount to anything. To protect himself from living in this hell all the time, the boy who gets hit separates from the main part of the boy who needs to get through everyday life. The trauma becomes a movie in the back of his head. That beaten child self 
plays over and over again, whether his older self is watching or not. In fact, the child tries to keep it from his older self so the older part can continue to grow up and move on. There are many such movies playing for each time the person faces a traumatic event. The more movies, the more energy is needed to keep them all playing, but hidden from the older self. The younger self continues to star in these movies 24 seven with no relief. Then one day, one of these movies gets triggered. The child is now grown. The trigger may be the day the man finds himself hitting his own child. His son looks up to him with disbelief with tears rolling down his, street, his cheeks. Suddenly the man is playing the role of his child self, experiencing the beatings he received as a little boy. The movie, the child self has been keeping separate from the man boy becomes present for the older self, complete with the event, the emotions, the body sensations and the negative beliefs. It feels as if it is happening now in living color. The good news is that this circuit in your brain can be rerouted. We know that releasing the emotional connection to the event allows a neural pathway to be created from the back of the brain to the front of the brain, where information, the data or memory can be stored in its proper chronological place in the past as is desired. Once this is done, the event no longer is emotionally connected in our brain. We remember it, but the memory will not recreate the intense emotional response in us. In other words, through reprocessing the trauma, we can rewire the brain to accept and store the story of the trauma without the emotions and body sensations. At this point, the negative beliefs no longer have a hold on you and a new set of positive beliefs can take hold efficiently and stick. And that specific movie is no longer playing. When good psychotherapy is done, these trauma movies are processed and shut down one by one, freeing up energy to be used in the present moment. This work also frees the child self to finish growing up and join the older self. The adult self may find he stops acting out in childish ways when he gets upset. This work can be very empowering for the client and help him feel like a confident grown up. Wow. So that was, uh, yeah, very, very well written. Um, I, I mean, I'm just my uh, instincts. Uh, thank you for sharing it. Uh, the, the stories, I think helped so much, uh, like the drowning, uh, almost drowning episode in the beach versus the normal day at the beach. Yeah, it's it's weird how, I guess it's not weird, but I'll, my feeling is it's weird that uh, the brain or just highly prioritizes, um, I guess, this, or favors or, and yeah, the, the negativity bias, right? So when things happen negatively, it'll stick if it's the reptilian brain, whatever it is that's going on versus when things are hunky dory, it's unless they're super hunky dory, really great, though that memory might stick as well. But the things that are kind of not too much either way, we forget easily. Um, yeah, it's very interesting why that happens, but it is a very clear picture. Um, yeah, and you, you would probably remember what did you eat for, for lunch that day if because you have constantly replayed the story and uh, people would fill in details or whatever. Well, I, I think most people have um, those types of memories and, and some of them are pleasant. I mean, they're not always awful, but mm -hmm. the ones that are awful, you don't necessarily want to keep that way. Yeah. And by letting go of that, um, I also do some inner child work within the process that I, that I do, which allows that the, the thing I was talking, the, the story I was telling you about the, the boy who was in the womb and took on his mom's stuff. Mm -hmm. I could only do that by doing inner child work and having the today uh, adult person explain 
to the younger person, the baby actually, in that case, um, that he's going to be there to, to take care of him and he doesn't have to worry mm -hmm. that he'll take care of all the problems. And that sticks too, to, to have a, a feeling that there's somebody that's got you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see how that the inner child, I've been doing a little inner child work uh, this year mm -hmm. and it's, it's powerful. A lot of crying because I just, you know, my father died when I was six. So uh, there was that boy remembering how that boy felt and how uh, I sort of grew up fast or however you want to phrase it, um, said, you know, and whatever things I believed about the world that I've learned now are not true. Yeah, I, I do feel in a way that this John now at 40 is the kind of the hero that I've always been waiting for, right? <laughs> My future yeah. self is really the one that's going to take care of business because uh, maybe I'm the only one. We each are our own hero and it, it can only be that way. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't bring your dad back. And, and even if you could, you know, like in this case of the story of the dad that, that hit his kid um, and grew up, to, well, grew up to hit his own child, um, which is not a real story, but it's, it's typical of the kind of stories I hear. Mm -hmm. um, it was, he needed to be the one that helped that younger self to let go of feeling that there was something wrong with him. It, there was something wrong with his dad not mm -hmm. something wrong with a child. There's no, never a good reason to, to strike a child. They're so much smaller than, than adults. Yeah, right. Yeah, it breaks my heart to even to think about that. But I, I know as a man, uh, I, especially when I had my son was baby, there's just and a lot of pressures and stresses. And it, I could easily see why terrible things happen between the a, a man and a baby, especially if, or a child, if the man is very stressed, if the man has no outlet, maybe no spiritual practice, no support, no like role models, mm -hmm. and plus like poverty or whatever, the, I can easily see why horrible things can happen. Because yeah, being a father, especially, I found when the child is very young, it was, you know, I, it's so small. You don't even know your own strength. You know, you could like right. throw, lift it too high and throw them accidentally. And I, I was scared of my own strength at that time. Um, anyway, I just want to acknowledge a comment. Uh, Amy Levin says, Rick Hansen says that our brains are like Velcro for negative and Teflon for positive, which is what Diane is suggesting. Yeah. Well, they, they basically say that for every, um, negative thing that we hear from somebody we need to hear 10 positive things for it to even be balanced <laughs> so yeah. you know when, when you're talking to your kids it's it's important to to be as positive as possible because they're going to hear a lot of negative stuff out there in the world you know we tend to say oh you know you, you had a great game but you know you missed the ball that one time you know right and they don't hear the first part or, or if they hear it, they definitely don't believe it. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's true. I, I think, do you think we need to saturate ourselves with love and praise? It, it, yeah. Like just like a plant needs water. You got to give it to it. I mean, when I was growing up, the, the whole thing was um, if you praise your child, they're going to get a big head. Mm -hmm. So it, people actually work to make sure they didn't praise their kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. I know that scene, um, not necessarily so much for my parents, but with the people I grew up with. And my wife, Yoko, says that, uh, you know, she grew up in Japan and she's a little older than me. And that the typical thing was the father uh, is supposed to put down their daughter in public. <laughs> that, like, that's yeah, what that probably do. helped a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like, Oh, you're so foolish. <laughs> yes, yes. And and that like is socially the socially acceptable thing. If he, if he said, you know, my daughter, I'm so proud of her. She's really following her dreams. Then everyone would get uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, culture has a lot to do with how um, how we do how well we do as people. 
Um, I mean, there are some cultures that are, are very loving and very supportive and those folks live longer, they're happier, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's other cultures that like in Japan and, and here too. I mean, we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're not all that great at it. Um, yeah. It's gotten better. Um, you know, I watched how my parents were with us and the culture at the time was really correct your kids. That's your job and don't ever praise them. And I did it very different way with my, my children. And they're yeah. doing it much better than I did, so. Mm -hmm. Great, and that's what we wanna see, you know, yeah. that, that each generation gets stronger and uh, happier, hopefully, <laughs> healthier and happier. Uh, so um, do you wanna talk about external gentle reprocessing a bit? Just, uh, and mention the offer that you have? Okay, so, um, I just, I developed external gender reprocessing um, to work with children, young children. Like it, I used it with kids as young as three. Um, it's basically uh, drawing and storytelling and uh, using, using the drawing. Because if you say to a kid um, that's unhappy, do you feel like when you get unhappy that it comes from someplace else? It's like a monster just gets in your body and makes you unhappy. And they go, yeah, that, that's what happens. I didn't do it. The monster did it, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I have them um, draw on a piece of paper uh, a picture of how they see themselves when they feel unhappy. Say, say angry, because it's usually more angry. Say how they see themselves when they feel angry. And then how, what the monster looks like all on the same piece of paper with a line down the middle to separate them. And usually the child is small and, you know, maybe his face is red or he's got fists, big fists or something like that on the, on the paper. And then the monster can be just a blob that, or, you know, some kids are more imaginative than that. And they cut the paper in half, separate the two pieces. And then they go back and forth with a crayon, black crayon and erase the monster, I call it erasing it, just coloring over, saying positive things about themselves. So at that point, they're taking the negative beliefs they believed about being at fault all the time and um, replacing them with these positive beliefs. I'm a good, good boy, good girl. I, I do my best, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then they start to tear the pieces of paper up in little pieces um, saying the same thing. So that's, that basically takes care of the problem. But then I have them tell me a story about them and two of their friends that have magic tools and the monster shows up and they defeat the monster in the story. Mm -hmm. And that's like a wake dream. Mm -hmm. so it, 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 it's like an empowerment piece. And then I have nice. them do the, the drawing over again as a kind of a diagnostic to see if we really did take care of the problem or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I, ha I made an online um, course out of this that has been available for probably about eight years. Um, and if anybody wants to go to my website, which is gentlereprocessing.com to the homepage, uh, they can sign up and I've been giving this away for free. And it's fine with, for parents to use with their kids um, or they can use it with each other or they can just do it for themselves. Uh, the, one of my students had a seven-year-old who she did the general reprocessing, I used to call it slaying the monster with. And that night her little sister who was five woke her up with a bad nightmare. And the little girl got out of crayons and she did it with her sister to show, to get rid of her nightmares and it took care of her nightmares. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's simple. It's to the point. And um, I, I've been teaching it to parents so that they can do it with their children. Um, because it, I, I almost feel like I'm robbing people by having them come into my office and I do this really simple thing. And, they could be doing it at home. So anyway. <laughs> wow, great. So if someone wants to to get the access, is it a PDF file or something? Um, 
it's a, uh, it's on my website um mm -hmm. so what will will happen is so they they go on the the home page they have to sign up for my newsletter and i don't really send it out very often um just in just letting people know if there's anything new happening then they have they get an email sent to their uh, email address they have to say okay this is the, i'm not a robot and i'm i really want this and then they get a, a link to get the program cool all right cool so they people just go to your website sign up the mailing list and uh just follow the prompts yeah. until they they get it yeah nice yeah i'm definitely interested in that um my son loves to draw we all love to draw my wife and i as well and i'd be curious well, I mean, to see what it, it you know. doesn't have to be anything huge um mm -hmm. But usually when I do this with kids, I do it when, you know, one or two times, even if it's a very serious thing, because they're little, they don't have a lot of stuff piled on top. But um, I used to do it, I, I, because I didn't see the kids for very long and I didn't really have a relationship with them, I'd have the parents stay in the room while we did it. So I started having the parents draw too. And then they were going, wow, I feel so much better. <laughs> so. Good. I find it works. It works well for adults as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely try it. Why not? And that's kind of that. That was designed for children, and then um, for kids, uh, probably twelve or and over, I use what I call internal general reprocessing, and that uses metaphors. Mm -hmm. So I have a bunch of different metaphors I can use, but I usually use a river. So the the people are the client is on a um and this one you really need a, a therapist to do with you mm -hmm. but um the client is on a um an island in the middle of the water in the river with protection around him and the water becomes the emotions and that allows the subconscious mind to actually let go of the emotions because the subconscious mind does not speak english mm -hmm. it speaks symbols um, you probably found that, John, sometimes with your music, you know, that's what really, when people hear a particular song that means something to them, mm -hmm. it's in their subconscious and all the feelings and everything are right there when they hear that particular piece of music. Maybe it's the first song they ever danced with their wives to or um, something like that, um, or they remember it when they were growing up. So anyway. I use symbols or, or metaphors to speak to the subconscious so the, we can actually let all of those negative emotions out of the subconscious by turning them into a metaphor. And once they become a metaphor, and with, with slaying the monster, the metaphor is a drawing. But mm -hmm. in the internal, the metaphor is actually the, the river or another metaphor like a fire pit or something like that if they can't visualize a river hmm. um, and with that i can go into the inner child work and help them you know go all the way back to the womb or when they were born if there was a problem when they were born or pre-verbal basically um, occasionally i've ended up going to past lives with people but it's more spontaneous hmm. If somebody actually worked with past lives, it might be really an interesting approach mm -hmm. to, to use this too. But um, it, I find that once everybody lets go of those emotions, the body starts to feel better, and then you can you can install the positive beliefs. Yeah, it's all, all fascinating stuff. And it's exciting to hear that um, some of it, some of what you're talking about sounds like it has a potential to happen to make people feel better quick. Well, most people I see for like three to six months. Mm -hmm. um, there are some other, you know, there's some folks that have, that are older and they have a lot, a lot of trauma that's going to take more than that. Right. but they start feeling better you know mm -hmm. within the first month you know right. they, they can see a difference yeah that's great like and the nice away. thing too is you know i can train people in three days 
to do what I do. And mm-hmm. they don't really need to come back to me and ask questions. I mean, some people do because they want to make sure they're doing it right. But I tell them, you can't do this wrong. <laughs> right. That's great. Hmm. So just letting you know, we have a, a listener in Brazil right now, João de Jesus. Uh, Hola, João. Obrigado para you. And he's watching there. Um, he's a friend I met when I was down there. And he'd like to... He says, I'd like to congratulate this big guy, John Henry, <laughs> this important live show to tell, tell us how to un- help us understand music and philosophy. So, obrigado, João. Uh, I appreciate that. Abraço. So, um, yeah, this is great. Uh, so, now I'm going to just steer away a little bit from uh, from our not i won't say uh, the heavier aspect because this is a very light um gentle talk about trauma but of course you can't talk about trauma and not get the implications of potentially heavy stuff uh to talk about music um so as you know i'm a strong believer in the power of music and can you share from your experience how music has positively impacted your life well my um parents were were loved to dance. So there was always music on and in my house growing up. And um, we lived next to a fairly large city. And that's when the big bands were were popular, and they they would go and dance to the big bands. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've always loved to dance. Um, uh, About 10 years ago, I learned how to swing dance, which is what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And that was so much fun. No. Um, so music has really made my life so much richer. And I, I think that that's the gift of music. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, so, it makes it makes a lot of people's lives richer. I get up with a song and, and I'm not, I have no voice, but I get up with a song um, and, and I'm singing and humming all day long. And um, I think that that puts us in just such a better place. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's so uh, so in- impactful that we have that opportunity to um, to express ourselves, right? And if for people who don't feel comfortable expressing themselves, I imagine you know it's like a, it's a release valve, right? So it, you let off pressure by having that uh, ability, and also there's just this feeling good part of um, creation. Right, like a songbird, a, a, a bird sings a song. To us, it sounds like noises maybe, or just birds making talking, but it's a song as well, you know? And uh, yeah, so powerful. Uh, João from Brazil mentions that he's the cultural director from uh, an association in Brazil. So um, when we speak music, I'm sure his ears perk up. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. <clears throat> so, um, so, Glenn Miller, Benny Goodman, uh, yeah. Duke, Duke Ellington, probably these guys have been in your oh yeah TV collection. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I played in jazz bands um, from high school through college, so I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Not my favorite style of music, but uh, I like it. I still have records that I've somehow come across and I'll put them on as I'm working and it's really nice uh, of those genres, you know. Um, seems that you love to travel from what I've gathered. Uh, can you speak about a little bit about your passion for traveling? I know you said you like to come home, but I'm sure you like to go as well. What do you get out of that? I love the adventure. Um, I, I never went on a plane until I was about 35. Hmm. Um, you know, it was just not something we did. Mm -hmm. And after the first flight where I almost killed my son holding his hand (laughs) because it was so tight. (laughs) Um, I just have been traveling ever since. And I, a lot of times I travel by myself, you know, maybe I'll I'll go to a group or sometimes I'll just go by myself and see what I can find. Um, One of my best adventures was going to the Bosnian pyramids in Bosnia. Wow. Where they only speak Bosnian. <laughs> wow. 
and I ended up lost on the pyramid. <laughs> Holy cow. I didn't know there were Bosnian pyramids and I, I have a, I have a good friend who's Serbian and I know it's nearby. I don't remember yeah. him ever mentioning that to me. Well, a lot of the Bosnians don't, don't know there's Bosnian pyramids. Okay. So I don't feel so bad. <laughs> it's one of those. Yeah. There's, it's one of those secrets that um, they don't want to believe is real, but I saw them <laughs> and they are pyramids. <laughs> wow. I like uh, height wise. Are they relatively small? They're bigger than the ones in Egypt. What? <laughs> Yeah, but they're covered with um, like trees and things. So oh. they're just starting to excavate. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, you, you could kind of pass it off as a weird looking odd shaped hill or something? Well, somebody who was a, um, an expert in pyramids looked at it one day and said, that's shaped just like a pyramid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's like, we don't see in what's in front of us until we see what's in front of us. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about a little long before and um, he saw, wow. So they dug down, they couldn't figure out why large trees didn't grow on these particular hills because the covering that they had put on was so um, hard that the roots couldn't work their way down. Mm -hmm. So, so there was some in the, in the, history of Bosnia, some very conscious attempts to hide these or something like that? No, no, they just, they just never, it never occurred to them that they were pyramids. Mm -hmm. Wow, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's, I like going to places like that because it's, it's really kind of, it, it's, it, I got to go there before it became um, a tourist type place. Mm-hmm. And it is now? Um, I think it will become. Yeah. You know, even when I was there, it was starting, people were starting to know about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Bosnian pyramids. And the same with Iceland. I, I find Iceland absolutely amazing. Um, and the first time I went, which was in the beginning of two, about 2002, um, it was not a touristy place. And mm -hmm. now, millions of people are going to an island that has 100 and 380,000 people living there. Right. right. Yeah, I know. I know uh, Iceland is this became this weird attract uh, main attraction in, in the globe um, for tourism and like nightlife and stuff like that and nature. Um, my mother went to Iceland in 1977, I think it was. So I have pictures from that trip. My mother's side of the family is Norwegian. So mm -hmm. she was on her way to Norway and uh, with my father and stopped at Iceland. And it, she said it was very unpleasant, her, her brief stay, you know, that, that, that was just in that one day in 1977, whatever, bad weather and said it smelled like sulfur everywhere. <laughs> but um, I would love to go there myself. But yeah, so I could, I'm sure at that era there was very little tourism is very intentional tourism if anything but now it's just like a hot spot i from what i understand yeah well a friend of mine just went and um they got to see the the lava pouring out of i mean like up close and personal the yeah. lava coming out of the latest um, eruption I, I saw some footage with drones and stuff it's like a real unique like celebration it's like almost like this big festival or something you know like a party mother nature is putting on a show for us you know? oh absolutely and uh, it that's what iceland's like all over the place they have the most beautiful waterfalls oh yeah um everywhere wow and you know geysers and, and they heat their homes with with the thermal underneath the ground mm -hmm. i i read a book called uh geography of bliss uh -huh. uh, forget the guy's name and this guy i don't know if you heard of it no um so this uh writer um journalist decided to travel the world for a year or two something like that maybe a year i don't know and try to find the happiest place in the world so it's like okay. a kind of like a trite yeah. idea but yeah. but he actually tried to do it and some some countries he clearly said this is not a happy country 
and uh but i think he i think he in his estimation iceland was the happiest yeah, it was definitely are, up up there it was definitely up there yeah the people were so wonderful there and and so interesting and very um involved in the land they if they um so they have these big rocks that are volcanic and mm -hmm. um they think that there are little beings that live in the rocks so if you're building a house and you you know if, say there's a rock one of these rocks in the spot you want to build a house you build the house around it you do not move it that's great because they say if you move the rock you are not going to be happy in that house i get it that that's really respecting the land right absolutely absolutely yeah, i totally get it and then um on the shore um uh, in Reykjavik they have the house the housing for the elderly is built on the on the shore so they have a view of the the, uh, the ocean because they say that the older people were the ones that you know supported the the island and supported the people on the island and now they should be taken care of well mm -hmm. yeah beautiful my like i said my family's from norway we have a lot of active communication you know a lot of relatives there mm -hmm. vast majority of my mom's family and uh I, I i'm very well aware of some cousins who the way they took care of their parents even in the old in old age home they were very like conscious of picking them up arranging for a ride taking them home to their house having dinner together just like really a strong sense of not forgetting or taking for granted any of the generations are right. very like cognizant of yeah of and it's the, not like a job and, no this is this life this is what you do yeah. it's family oriented yeah 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 that's great and this this type of thing is uh what i found because i had the fortune to travel a bit made me realize that um my life was uh precious you know i, I found when i was a child i, I went to Norway when I was two, then again, when I was nine and, and a few other times. And compared to the kids in my neighborhood, I just felt like I was more sensitive. Yes, I'm an empath. My father would die when I was young. That was something. But I really felt that traveling to Norway and knowing I have roots somewhere. Yes. And that I, I'm important. You know, people love me. I, I'm I have like a, this whole culture of my my Nana, my grandmother, told me many war stories about when German occupied Norway and what she lived through and, and, and the, the lights out early and Polish prisoners and all that. So uh, to come back and my kids, my, my, the guys in my block are, you know, kind of not seriously, but throwing around racist slurs and getting into trouble and doing some stupid stuff. And I just never related to that. And, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I want to be a goody two shoes. It wasn't that I just felt that we shouldn't waste our time with uh things that are you know there's life's too beautiful you know it was right, kind of my right. sense right you know um so can you uh oh what what aspects of your life philosophy help you to recover from setbacks if you don't mind sharing my mom always used to say every cloud has a silver lining and I think I look for the silver lining. I mean, I've gone through at least two, maybe three de um, dark nights of the soul. Um, and, but even while I was in that space, it was like, okay, I know I'm gonna come out of this and I'm gonna, gonna come out of this in a better space. Mm -hmm. So, I think that that's been kind of my philosophy. I know it's simple, but mm -hmm. it works for me. So, so basically a faith in the universe that kind of a faith in that the universe is benign and that it has your best interests in at hand in a way. Not mm -hmm. even. Yeah. I, I definitely have a lot of faith in that, in that sense. Um, but it's not even that it has to have my best interest in mind. It's just, what will be will be and you know get the most out of it if you can mm -hmm. 
yeah like i think eleanor roosevelt was said something like uh you know if you if you if i could live through this then what can i live through so i guess right. like once you have that precedent of overcoming a serious challenge and something happens again you know that you will get through it you know and I, I mean, I've been really blessed, John. My my life has not been that bad. Um, I, I hear horrible stories from some of my clients, and I don't even know why they're still walking and talking. Mm -hmm. And they still, I mean, I kind of feel like, wow, if people can live through this kind of stuff, I don't have anything to complain about. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the beauty of the job you do by offering this service, you're putting yourself out there to help people I imagine day in, day out, or certainly for a long period of your life, um, you get the perspective that actually, wow, I do have a wonderful life. You know, I yeah. think that's like one of the benefits I imagine. Um, so I just want to uh, let you know that our friend Joao de Jesus from Brazil mentioned that um, uh, in when we were talking about um, Iceland and it has uh, a lot of natural phenomena. He's he's in a town called Caldas do, jo do Joho, and uh, which I've been to a few times. And he, he says, as you know, it's very hot. It's cold there today, but um, they have hot springs. So it's kind of I know uh, Iceland is known for hot springs. Mm -hmm. We went to this town, this place, pretty small town in the middle of Bahia. Brazil, very dry area. There's this like bath kind of sh shower structure in the middle of the town and out of it pours this scalding hot water all day long. And it, there's no mountains, very flat, dry land, not desert, but uh, a very dry land. And it's just this scalding hot water. You know, it's very interesting what you're going to find. And that was, you know, on my travels that, that I discovered that. Well, it, it's so fun when you find these things. Um, I was in um, Bulgaria and um, we had, I, I, my, my, two of my daughters were in the Peace Corps. So this is one of the ones that was in the Peace Corps in Bulgaria. And we'd taken a bus to this little town and we, there was like a, a building that you had to walk a long way and it was hot. And I'm like, I just, was doing jet lag and it was like, oh man, I, I don't want to do this walk. But, you know, I was, I, I felt like I was there. So I just should see what was, what was what with this building. So you walk across this bridge and you go up to the building and it's up on a hill and it went in and I was blown away with the ceiling. It was a dome ceiling with these beautiful paintings, all um, depicting the history of Bulgaria and it, wow. it was just fabulous mm -hmm. and it was in this little tiny town that you'd never would have you know probably wouldn't even thought thought to go there right but there was a hostel there so we stayed on our way back to um Dobrich. and um it's things like that you just don't know yeah oh, you yeah, know they, they just surprise you <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i don't know why they surprise us but they like i don't know being from new york like or maybe from being america but from, being from new york i i walk around with this i don't know if it's an ego but like there's no place like new york which i do feel is true but uh <laughs> you know <laughs> but at the same time that you could say that about every place right yeah. any place you go you could say there's no place like that so, um, yeah. Well, and that's the beauty of the world. There is no place like each of these places. Mm -hmm. But when you haven't experienced them, it's like, wow, it's so fun to, to go and experience different spots. Yeah, and the world is huge, as it is small, but it's also quite huge. Yeah, yeah. so I do like yeah. to travel. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll be awesome. glad when when uh, that's made easier for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you went to some cool places. You went Bulgaria and uh, not sir, what was it Bosnia? Bosnia. Those, yeah. are, are, were those both influenced by your daughter? 
not Bosnia, but um, Bulgaria was. And then my other daughter was in Latvia. The, she wasn't in the Peace Corps in Latvia, though. And that was, that was absolutely fantastic, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's great. Those are countries I really hadn't, do not think I'll ever get to unless I go on tour for some reason for a book I write maybe one day. But, uh, but they fascinate me because of how little I know about them and how small they are. But probably when you're there, they feel pretty big. Latvia loves music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody sings. You can, oh. you can find a, uh, in Riga, that's the, the state capital, every night you can find at least four or five uh, music venues hmm. of some sort. Right. It's, everybody, you know, they play instruments, they sing, they're, they're very cultural. Hmm. Wow. And the buildings are extraordinary. And, uh, and do they have their own is Latvian language or, or? Yes. Yeah. And it uses Roman characters or, um, no, or, or Cyrillic. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, I th I'm trying to think they've lived in, my kids have lived in so many different places and some are Cyrillic and some are Roman, but right. yeah, I think it's Roman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would... They also uh, were under uh, Russian influence for a really long, a long time. time. Yeah. So they were made to learn Russian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like Ukraine and many other countries. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend uh, from Lithuania, so I know a bit about that area. I guess there's some commonalities over there. Um, so thank you. Can you share up to three inspiring books, films, or TV shows that you would like to recommend to our listeners? Let's say people are feeling a bit down. They want something new, um, inspiring to check out. One, one of my favorite books to offer to, to clients is the four agreements. And I, I mm. afraid I can't remember the author, but, um, if people are feeling lost, it's four simple ways of looking at your life that if you actually work on them just a little bit, it's going to make you feel mm -hmm. better. I'm just going to get a pen. I'm going to write down what you said. Yeah, the, my mother uh, recently, I read that a while ago and I loved it. Um, I wrote, my mother recently, I think, bought a few copies of uh, a miniature version of the four yeah, agreements. Yeah, yeah, I love that and little book. Given them out. Yeah. Yeah, that, that one helped. I, I encountered that when I went to the School of Practical Philosophy uh, in, I think it was the Upper East Side of Manhattan back in around 2007. And it was yeah, very helpful. Well, it, it's, it's a very simple way um, of getting your compass. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I think a lot of people have lost their compass as far as they don't have a way of they don't know how to be in the world right or get back to center or, or that yeah. zero place yeah it's a good reminder of like oh shoot that isn't my business my yeah. business is here yeah so four agreements um uh, five else? love languages which i think should be taught in every high school it would save people a lot of angst <laughs> The idea behind it is that um, people receive love in different ways. And if you understand how somebody wants to receive love, as opposed to, we tend to give people love the way we want to receive love mm -hmm. instead of the way they would like to receive love. So it doesn't feel like love to them. <laughs> right. Interesting. And again, that's, that's a really simple um, book to to pick up and you can just read the back cover and you get the gist of it. Do you know the uh, author? Uh, I don't offhand. I'm, well, I'm going to put the link so I'll okay. find it. I'm sure it's, there's only one book with that name, right? And is there a third one? Yeah, this one, this one got me out of, uh, out of one of my dark nights of the soul. And it's called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. You're probably familiar. Yep, I read that a few times. Yeah, I probably read it 20. <laughs> I didn't read it that many, but oh yeah. man. But yeah. every time I read it, it felt like I was reading a totally new book. Yeah, I had that. I, I think I read it solidly through twice and both times I'm like, I loved it. And the second time, 
didn't really remember it, you know, I'm like, this is, uh, yeah, because it, it really brings you into the now, I guess, and it addresses whatever needs to be addressed in you at that moment. Yeah, what, what, a, what a masterpiece, really. So those, those would be the ones that I'd recommend, depending on, you know, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, it's always nice to, to do a nonfiction mystery, too, once in a while. A nonfiction mystery? Oh, a fiction mystery. Oh, okay, oh, okay yeah. 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 Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, I, I I haven't done one in a while, but I certainly I really loved Sherlock Holmes. I think I read Agatha Christie a little bit, and some Dean Koontz has some mystery. Yeah, um, yeah, fiction can do can do wonders too, right? Um, even well, for self healing and self development too, to, if if you approach it a certain way, I guess. Well, I I think that um, some of my book is going to be fiction because I don't want to use real clients, mm -hmm. but you know, you can, you, you can use fiction to, to get your, a lot of points across. Yeah. 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 And I know what I noticed about fiction is uh, it spends a lot of time on the experience of life. Yes. Which when you, when you write nonfiction uh, it's, kind of hard to do right um it doesn't take you into these present moment realities that you can kind of relate to the same way that fiction does uh yeah it, it's it's really a gift uh, well-written fiction i mean any well-written book in general but mm -hmm. um i read i i went to this beautiful cemetery we have in brooklyn called greenwood cemetery it's one of my favorite places to go and we went there last fall and there's a these little trails along, you can actually get lost in it. It's, it's that big in a car, you can get lost. And we do every time. And uh, it, there's little trails. And one of them was Hawthorne path. It just like cuts through, you got to walk through it. And I'm like, I never read Nathaniel Hawthorne and it's on my dad's shelf. And I don't think it was named after him, but I went and I found a book and I read this book of his, the house of the seven gables. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Took me a long time to get through it the way I read. I, I read various, several things at a time and I'm just peeling a few pages away a day, but very psychologically dense of like shaping these characters, you know, and very unique characters that I could relate to. And nobody writes like that anymore. It's uh, a lot of time spent kind of going nowhere, but just painting the picture of, a, of an individual and what their life must have been like to get them at this point. And, just a whole different way of seeing the world, you know? So I'm glad I read that. And I, I that's 1800s, I think, I guess. And uh, yeah, that, that, and I guess at that time, right, you, there was no psychology or so, psychotherapy. So to get, do, to get whatever psychotherapy can give you, reading fiction might have been the closest thing at that time, you know, to kind of get into the mindset of people. Perhaps, well, yeah. You know? and, and, and I think that people try, it, it's like Sherlock Holmes the way he does fiction mm. you know he really tries to get into the mind of the person yeah and the motivations and all that yeah, yeah. well you know it, um one other book I'd probably recommend is the Celestine Prophecy mm -hmm. James because, uh what's his yeah name? James, yeah James Patterson is that it no not, not Patterson <laughs> um oh yeah he's an author he's a different yeah he's know. he's he's different but first name's James, and I don't know the author, but um, that's fiction. But it's a wonderful way if you want to start to understand energy. Yeah, I mean, I did read that. Uh, I want to say James Redfield, but whatever, I'll find it. Okay. Um, and put that in the show notes too. Yeah, that was pretty cool. I, I love anything about piercing the veil, like uh, Carlos Castaneda had some stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've read other ones. I just actually read a book by a guy named Terry Lovelace. Uh, I met him in Sedona, Arizona this past March. He was there give, give, giving a talk about his alien abduction experience, which, ha which happened in the late 70s. That's the perfect place to have it because in Sedona, <laughs> everybody's had their own little experiments. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was just perfectly natural to talk about it at this retreat. Yeah. And uh, I talked to him at length and I bought his book, just finished it. And it's not like a, 
it's not like the Celestine prophecy in the sense that it's a good message or like doesn't paint these beings that he encountered in a good light. It doesn't, it's nothing to be afraid of, but he's just kind of spreading the word that these things happen and we, we, people get picked up. And if you, if it's happened to you, it's, it's kind of, it's this trauma and that there's help, there's help out there. There's networks, there's people who listen to you. They're not going to think you're crazy because he knew what it's like to carry this with him. He was in the air force and he, uh, then he was working as a lawyer. So you just can't talk about that stuff, but it, it, he had nightmares and stuff for a long time. And then writing the book was a really cathartic for him. Uh, yeah. Um, general processing can usually get rid of nightmares in one or two sessions well, because a nightmare is your body's way of trying to process the stuff on the back burner, but you get so scared halfway through that you usually wake up before it gets done. Hmm. Wow. I, well, I, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. So like, you, you, are you saying like, if perhaps if people could, um, get through it with, without giving into the fear or the panic, then it would just kind of like, well, and a lot of times it does, you know, mm -hmm. people have a nightmare over and over again for years and then it just goes away. Right. And it's usually because they processed it, but it's a lot to go through, you know, sleepless nights and whatever. Um, yeah. It's not fun. No, it's not, but it's one of the things I, I like about my process is that it can take care of a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't normally think about. You know, you might not go to therapy to get rid of nightmares. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would if it got bad enough, but. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's great. So uh, what are your plans in the next several months? Uh, I imagine some book writing is in there. Yeah. Um, I I've got two more chapters in the book to finish. Two more, wow. and and the I mean, they're they're rough, but um, I'm hoping uh, Deborah Evans can help me make them a little smoother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm doing a podcast with John Sheridan tonight. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> Can't wait to to watch the archive version or listen to it. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm going to start looking for some other podcasts to get on and just to let people know that it's coming, mm -hmm. and see what happens. I mean, if one person reads it and it's helpful to them, I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a crucial attitude, especially with the type of work a person like yourself is doing, and I would. I feel similar in the same sort of category, which is, this is uh, something I feel is useful. This is something I feel is necessary to my growth as a human being to kind of like complete my mission. I sense you have a similar mm -hmm. relationship to your book and your message that if it helps one person, it was worth it. Cause I also imagine you'd be getting something out of the writing of it too, some sort of well, it, it, it puts everything down on paper. And to be honest, I, I don't want to leave the earth before I share what I've learned because mm -hmm. it would be such a waste. I mean, mm -hmm. I put a lot of time and energy into this, not, not like a work because it's, it's, it's been fascinating and I'm always learning from my clients, new things and new ways of doing things. Um, so it's been a process, yeah. but I would like people to know that this process has been done and that they can benefit from it and, and, you know, start with, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can start where I left off and go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally hear it. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm quite sure that you've already affected more than one person with your story just by reading tonight and reading in the book group and just by your writing it, I'm sure it's in influencing your own life when you're treating people maybe with a little more, I don't know, joy just, because you're doing something that you want to do for yourself, you know? I, I just don't want people to think that trauma is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that it, it's, it, it used to be if you had cancer, nobody wanted to talk to you because it was almost like they were going to catch it or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the C word. They didn't want to have any conversation around it. And trauma is kind of like that. Um, now they 
people don't want to hear your trauma. They don't want to hear what you have to say. And mm -hmm. one of the cool things about this is I don't have to hear much of your trauma in order to do the work. So I am not getting secondary trauma from your trauma by hearing it. Um, all I need to know is like maybe what age you thought, thought you were and um, what, who the players were and three, three sentences about what happened. Mm -hmm. Because you have all that in your head. Mm -hmm. So I just say, when you think about when you were six years old and your, your dad passed, what feeling comes up for you and where do you feel it in your body? Mm -hmm. And we go through all the feelings and all the body sensations. And by the time we're done, um, you feel a lot lighter. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then, then we put in new um, uh, cognitive statements. Mm -hmm. Like it's just say to that little boy, you know, I'm glad I got to know my dad as long as I did, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to feeling that he got chipped. Mm -hmm. yeah and i'm uh, sorry if, if this is too personal no no uh, it's uh, i'm very uh, open book about certainly about that okay. um yeah i have a video about you know music video i've been singing about the situation for a long time so yeah perfect yeah perfect example you know um yeah and and i'm all about healing so whatever the heck healing i could do you know I, I, I liked, I, I kind of liked knowing that I have healing yet to do, you know, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a funny way to do it because I, I like uh, sorting, I like organizing, I like reprocess, <laughs> I like processing things, you know. Would you like to come to my house and work <laughs> on it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a car, but uh, oh. yeah. No, but it, it, it's, that that's it's why it's important for me to get this book out and and down and even if there's only one copy somewhere i'll i'll be happy to have it out there and somebody may you know 15 years from now or 80 years from now pick it up and go wow this mm -hmm. is i can use this now yeah oh yeah I, I encourage you if you do have a chance to check out the podcast next week with Andy because okay. uh, her mission is very. Um, I think you'd be inspired by it. She, I met her at Sedona, Arizona. Okay. And she, uh, she has this vision that she wants to. It's a, it's a new, a new thing she's doing in the world that she wants to help authors get their vision into the world. She believes that taking like these uh and when she when she says authors she means creative people that have ideas that they want to share right so maybe you might not identify yourself as author yet since you're not holding the book you wrote but you are right because you know you have a book in you or several and she says you know that people creatives need to often need help to bring it in from the ether into a solid form but mm -hmm. by doing that you actually uh you're grounding this energy right you're like you're grounding this energy on this planet right so the the more we do more we in, empower people everyday people to stand in that power and ground their creative energy in this lighter frequencies like especially the type of book you're writing or the type of book I, i'm aspiring to write that that's meant to help people meant to uplift meant to enlighten the more people we are doing that the the basically the higher the vibration of the planet will be yeah. you know imagine right imagine you walk into a bookstore and it's all horror, horror books or you walk into a bookstore and it's all these the vibration is going to be different yeah that's it's the same with with the mega theater, theater i was talking about mm -hmm. you know but yeah absolutely and i want people to think of trauma as their friend Mm -hmm. might as well right well i yeah i mean to, to not be afraid of it and, and not feel they can't talk about it mm -hmm. and they can talk about it and they can actually let it go and it doesn't have to be hard yeah I mean, I that. my my clients do work hard when they're in my office but it's usually for about 40 minutes Mm -hmm. And then they feel great. 
Yeah. It, it's, it's where we're worth it, right? Each individual is worth feeling good. And absolutely. If, if we got to do, if we and, have to do something every, to feel good. That's and fine. every time somebody gets healed from trauma, they make the world better because they're not their broken self in the trauma. They're, they're, they're complete self. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And then they can hold space for other people who are, who are going through it. And if they can't right. help directly, they can at least be a, not a deflecting, right. They could just be an open energy, right. right? They can feed others with light. And I, I think that it's, we're at the perfect time, John, right now, that all of that energy is starting to grow and get better and people are supporting each other in different ways. And um, yeah, I it's, sense not, it. it's not as bad as it looks like on the news. <laughs> right. I mean, no. I haven't watched the TV news since Vietnam. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, that's great. And if I'm sure that uh, hasn't uh, harmed you in any way, right? Was there maybe one day you went out without an umbrella? That that was about what, uh, what it amounted to? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we, we don't watch the news in our house and we haven't had a TV channel uh, since we moved back from Japan. So uh, since 2000, late 2012, yeah, barely ever I, had I haven't TV. had a TV since 2000. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I do Netflix when I feel like it, but right. It it when they started making me pay for TV, I was like, no, <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. not doing that. <laughs> it's right. not that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we watch Netflix, YouTube, but we very consciously choose what we're going to watch. You know, and uh, we have a TV screen to to plug the right. computer into, but yeah. and DVDs that we choose, you know? So, uh, so where can people find you and learn more about what you're doing in the world and what you offer? You already said your site, but you know, please uh, share it again. It's uh, gentle reprocessing.com. Okay. And that will bring in, or if you put in Diane Spindler, I'll come up. Um, Google's keeps telling me I don't come up very well, but I come up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, most of the information about general reprocessing is on my website. It, it's, it's pretty wordy, but um, there's a, it's in sections. So whatever people are interested in um, the case studies are pretty interesting um, mm -hmm. that just tell you in, in a, you know, page about a, a particular case and how it went. Okay. So, and if people, do you offer private sessions? If people want to connect with you, is it only local? Um, do you do I online see people sessions? on Zoom. Um, you do? Okay. So, mm -hmm. And I've been seeing people in my office since last May, a year mm -hmm. ago. Oh, wow. Um, if they want to come in. I mean, it, it, there's no pressure one way or the other. Right, right. Um, right now, I've got a waiting list. Mm -hmm. So, but if people wanted to get in touch with me, we could, you know, talk. I see. All right. So it's curious for anyone yeah. who might be interested. Wonderful. Diane, it's been fun. I, was, I could see you and I could just talk all night. Um, there's so yeah, much. Yeah, we might be getting kind of boring for the rest of the people that are listening. Well, yeah, two hours is a good good cap, you know, to uh, to give people a solid something to talk about. And who knows, maybe we could do a part two one day when, when you're done with the book or as closing in. Okay. You come that and show it cool. off, you know? Yeah. Yeah, when I actually have a front page and all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah. yeah, let's keep cheering each other on. Uh, uh, with I the would, I just really appreciate that. You know, my hope is to get it out by the end of the year or you know, beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. I think it's just time. Excellent. I'm I'm sure you can do it. And uh, if it's not in exactly the timeline you envision, it'll be in its own good time. You know. I'm sure it won't be 10 years from now. So it's a <laughs> no, not if I'm writing it, probably not. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's coming, you know, I could, yeah. I could, I could see that very, very clearly. And, and I'm very happy about it. I can I look forward to reading it. 
well, I, I hope people enjoy it. And I mean, and it's not going to be like a good fiction book, but I hope they get something out of it and they are able to say, oh, now I understand myself much better. Mm -hmm. You're putting your life and your intention into it. So they're going to, you know, people will feel something. And I, I can tell you it, it's going to be impactful for whoever reads it because I've heard the words. It, it wakes up things inside of me like, oh, that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, things that I, I want to make sense out of that you illuminate. You know, it's almost wow. like, oh, I knew that, but I, I didn't know it, but I, I did, you know, at the same time. Well, the first half of the book talks about that. And the second half of the book is hopeful that there's, there's a method out there that really works. Mm -hmm. and, and just so people know, the first 10 years of my using this method, every time it worked, I go, wow, because <laughs> I didn't expect it to work. <laughs> right. That's great. Yeah. So it's got a little bit of magic to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that's, again, that, that has to do with the purity of your approach. It's like, it's not, it didn't come from this vaulting ambition to, uh, you know, be the best, uh, psychiatrist or, so, um, a counselor counselor in the world. Uh, it was just, you just kept doing it because you wanted your clients to have more success in, in feeling good. Well, there is a book called The Reluctant Messiah. I'm the mm -hmm. reluctant counselor. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, John. It's been really fun to talk to you and to learn a little bit more about you as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's been great, Diane. Have a wonderful night. Fantastic summer. And I'll send you this, these links um, by tomorrow morning. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Fantastic. Have a good weekend. You Bye. Too.